So welcome, everyone. I am so pleased uh, to see such a great uh, turnout for this event. We're just so very fortunate to have um, Joshna Maharaj here with us um, in, and did I say your name right, Joshna? <laughs> um, with us in the province. Um, she was at Acadia yesterday, I think, and came, came here to Halifax to spend the day with us. So we're very uh, lucky and look forward to um, spending the day with you and, and with Joshna and learning together um, about um, food and how our institutions can um, really take advantage of some of the opportunities here in Nova Scotia around food. So um, Mount St. Vincent University, you're, you're sitting in the what's called the faculty lounge, and we have a strong history of social change um, here within this university. So I'm really pleased um, on behalf of the Mount to, to welcome you, and also on behalf of Food Arc, the Food Action Research Center. Um, I'm the director at Food Arc, Patty Williams, and um, I have a, a mighty hosting team here with me today, and we'll introduce ourselves um, as we go along. But um, so. This event is um, a part of a long-standing collaboration and our many people in this room are part of that collaboration and it spans, um, as I'll tell you in a minute, 15, 15 years more. Um, but this specific project actually is, um, the title is, is up there, Cultivating Change, Putting Food First in Nova Scotia, so that's why we're here. And it's um, a knowledge sharing support award that we, um, partners um, and Food Arc, we're able to secure from the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation. Um, we are working in collaboration with many partners, but the sort of the key leads on this uh, particular initiative is um, we're co-hosting with the Ecology Action Center and, um, and Select Nova Scotia as well, provided funding for this event. And um, we're also doing it in partnership with the Department of Health and Wellness and the Department of Agriculture. So. Um, really pleased um, to be able to come together around this issue and take advantage of Joshna being here with us. So I'm going to pass it over to um, Sarah Thompson, who is going to be our um, hostess for, for today, um, our facilitator, and um, we're going to tag team. So. Thanks, Patty. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Thompson, for those of you that don't know me, and um, I call myself a social innovator, and my work is really around helping to catalyze social change and bringing together lots of different people who are uh, involved in an issue to help change an issue, and I've been privileged to be supporting the food movement in Nova Scotia for over 10 years. Um, today, the really the purpose of this event is to learn from the incredible work that Joshna has been doing in Ontario, um, to share success stories from her and from other really amazing pioneering local projects on the ground in Nova Scotia, um, to further build connections and networks, particularly around institutional procurement and how we can catalyze that and move that further in Nova Scotia, and to really inspire action, inspire new connections, um, and inspire change. Uh, I do want to just remind you that we are taking photos today, so hopefully you have signed a photo release form, and if you're not, if you don't want to have your photo taken, that's great. There are dots in the, in the um, registration table, so please just put a dot somewhere where we can see it so that we'll know to keep you out of the photos. Also, if you're a social media type, we are using the ha hashtag uh, no NSFoodShift today, so please be um, happy. Please share and live tweet with this event in whatever way you want. Um, and it's really pretty simple. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna briefly just share a little bit of context around the, the need and the current conditions around institutional procurement, both locally and across Canada. Um, and then we're gonna have a really nice time to settle in and just listen to the, the work that Joshna has been doing followed by a couple of local stories, and then some time for Q&A. And I know some of you are also staying this afternoon for a sort of practitioner-oriented workshop with Joshna, and I'll tell you more about that when it's time. So I think I'm handing back to Patty now. So I'm just gonna really briefly give you a sense of kind of the work that we've been doing here in Nova Scotia on community food security. Um, 
as I said, we've been working together with many partners um, over the last 15 years, and we've done both quantitative and qualitative and mixed methods research to really understand the issue of um, community food security. How do we build more just, healthy, and sustainable food systems for everyone in the province? And we um, learn through um, our research, through um, surveys, in-depth interviews, um, lots of different methods, photo voice, story sharing, and so on, that um, there are major, some major barriers and major opportunities here in the province. And so um, this is really a timely, um, you know, event to be able to take a look at that. So just to set the context, what we heard is that some of the, the main barriers that exist um, in terms of um, food security in the in the province is is really for pr producers to be able to get food to people to Nova Scotians in terms of sort of markets and there's um, we heard about lots of um, silos um, top-down approaches and so in 2010 we embarked on a project um, I'll switch my slide here, called, um, some of you would be familiar, familiar with this, may have been involved, um, I know some people were involved, but um, we released this report in November 2014, and it was the first ever comprehensive report on community food security in the province that brought together a lot of this, this research that we've been doing. And so um, there were over 600 um, people that informed kind of what we focused on in the project. We had conversations about community food security and we heard what mattered to Nova Scotians around the issue of, of food. Um, we really wanted to understand not only kind of what were citizens um, concerned about, what were the issues within communities. We worked specifically with four what we called case communities, Eastern Shelburne County, Pictou County, um, Spryfield and King Eastern, Northeastern um, Kings County to get, um, so really to be representative of Nova Scotia in terms of the diversity within our food systems and within our population. And then also um, we did a comprehensive policy scan. And so what we, um, we heard that there are uh, many, um, as I said, opportunities and challenges facing both producers and, um, and fishers within the, in the province, and that people really want to get um, local food. So um, we examined, I can't go through it all because I don't have time, but just to give you a sense of the research, we did uh, 15 in-depth interviews with people within the fishing industry to hear about some of the barriers um, facing that community within Eastern Shelburne County, and a couple of people that were leading that work are here today. And um, really, um, there's a report that's been produced, a video on this, so there's a lot more sort of in-depth um, research that um, you can dig into if you're interested. I don't have time to share that today, but just to give you a sense, and, uh, um, and I'm on the wrong slide, so um, just to give you a sense, I'm gonna flip through to the right slide. <laughs> um, so what we heard about within, um, within the research is that um, people are really, what people care about is that we need systems that sustain um, local food in our communities, um, but there's barriers to that. Um, that people um, you know, have challenges in relation to physical access to food, in terms of um, transportation, in terms of um, areas existing where convenience stores and um, other types of more unhealthy sources of food outnumber healthier sources of food in communities. Um, we talked to individuals and we learned more about the challenges faced by low-income families and individuals in the province around the experience of food insecurity and some of the stigma and judgments that they face. We also heard that it's really important for people to be able to come together around food, whether that's in their homes or within their communities or within workplaces and other settings. We heard that breastfeeding is an important part of food security for people, which is not normally part of our conversation, so it was really great to hear, have conversations about that. And we learned about the supports that are necessary and some of the barriers that um, people face in the province around breastfeeding, particularly for people that are experiencing food insecurity and some of the dilemmas that they face. And we heard about some unique situations in the province, so um, changes that were happening within the farming, um, migrant workers, and how that impacts kind of farming and some of those issues, um, the lobster industry and some of the challenges um, facing with um, more recent changes in terms of regulations in that industry. Um, special diets was another area. And then um, 
issues facing Mi'kmaq communities in the province. And so what we um, sort of synthesizing it all down, we and listening to, we took it out and talked to, I think it was around 50, um, seven stakeholder groups in the province and our team members and really um, from this produced a comprehensive set of strategies um, focused on building healthy, just and sustainable food systems and we identified five areas that were ripe for action and so that's what's landed us here today because one area that was really um, had, had a lot of a momentum, um, the Ecology Action Centre was doing um, a lot of work in this area and has done a lot of work and others as well and so we've come together around this to try to learn from um, Joshna's experience with this and learn from the experience that all of you bring to this topic um, today. So we're gonna dig into this one particular area that's ripe for action today, and so I'm really excited to, to be able to do that. But maybe oh no, it's okay. It? No? I'm not sure what happened, but we'll figure it out here. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My name is Satya Ram, and I'm with the food team of the Ecology Action Centre, and um, it's actually my uh, colleague, Justin Contafio from the Marine team and I who've been, there you are, <laughs> who've been um, working to help to coordinate this with Food Arc and are so excited to be here. I am just going to figure out what slide I'm supposed to be on, um, but I think, I think this is ish, but I will do it in a minute. I'm just going to minimize this. <laughs> we'll just get some of, I'll just tell you a little bit um, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you, I guess, that slide that we're referring to there is um, a little bit about uh, the survey some of you would have filled out when you registered. So I'll share some of that in a few minutes. But what I'm going to do first is just set a little bit of the landscape of institutional procurement. Um, for Some of you have been really active in this area. Some of you might be a little bit newer to it. So we wanted to just share some context and some information across um, for everyone. So. Whether it's about reducing our environmental footprint, so looking at paper content and recycled paper, or advancing social justice, like addressing sweatshop labor in purchasing practices, changing institutional procurement policies and practices are an important piece of the puzzle for a healthy, sustainable future. So that's been a there's been a good solid history of that across um, North America, and increasingly, private and public institutions are turning their attention to food, which is why we're all here today, um, specifically foods that reflect our values. So values. Um, um, to ensure that we know where our food is sustainably produced and harvested and under conditions that support good jobs and working conditions as well. Um, and our purchasing practices can help address complex and interrelated issues. For example, individual health, so access to healthy foods, as we know we have rising um, d uh, rates of chronic disease, um, ensuring that we have healthy air, soil, water, um, and improving farming and fishing incomes and recirculating money within communities and helping to create jobs. So these are some of the things that institutional procurement practices can actually help to, to create a momentum for change around. Um, the challenges though are real and again for those of you working in this sector and working to create these change they are really real. Sometimes they feel pretty hard. Um, and market forces are very effective at maintaining globalized food systems that we have right now and maintaining kind of the status quo that we have. So we're all swimming upstream here a little bit. So we've lost a lot of our local processing infrastructure and distribution capacity to connect local food producers with local markets. Um, Just-in-time delivery and an expectation of ready access to food year-round has really shaped and changed how today's institutional kitchens are managed and operate. So everything from labor practices, skill sets, equipment, space for storage, and menu planning are all shaping what's coming out of these kitchens. Um, marketing and available of less healthy and often, but often more convenient foods is certainly influencing food choices and has an impact on the health and well-being of individuals and communities. And all of this is at a loss of our individual community economic and environmental health. Um, and working at scale means addressing some of these issues like availability, distribution, seasonality, food preferences, fairness, and cost. So there's a lot of things going into this. However, we can address these challenges and meet some of our shared goals. So here in Nova Scotia, we actually have a few um, opportunities. We have a goal that's um, uh, part of our uh, Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act to um, increase the amount of money spent on food going back to uh, Nova Scotian producers. Um, the goal is 20% by 2020. The uh, One Nova Scotia or Ivany report outlined a goal of um, doubling the value of ag agricultural products for the, our local market by 20 
2024. And we also have a cross-departmental Thrive um, strategy, which is about healthy living and creating active, healthy lifestyles for everyone here in this province. So we have some common shared goals, some, some things to build on. Um, the good news is that we're not alone in this effort. So across North America, institutions are tuning into this conversation and creating change. Um, and what's emerging is really pretty interesting. So we have people who are skilled in facilitating these shifts coming and we're going to hear from one of them today. So this is kind of coming out of some of the work. We have new partnerships and organizations such as nonprofit profit food providers, di food distribution groups that are popping up all over the place, research into existing practices and new approaches, so testing, evaluating what's working, what's not, how to make change, funding to help institutions figure out how to achieve these changes. Um, case studies, tools, sample contract language, it gets down to the nitty gritty sometimes to really support the people who are on the ground in making those changes. Training, campaigns to raise awareness and garner support, and infrastructure and even software that can help connect producers and markets. So there's a lot of good things happening that can help, that we can build on to help make this change. And you'll hear some of the concrete examples I'm referencing this morning when you hear from Joshna and then as well the two kind of local stories that we have very close to home in New Brunswick. There's a, I'm not going to say it in French, Réseau de Cafeterias, well maybe I will, the network of community cafeterias I think it's called, the translation operates in 25 francophone schools in southeastern um, New Brunswick and they have 60% of their ingredients are sourced from a local food hub, they've invested in training, programs for staff, they host farm visits, educational visits, they're really changing the landscape of food in schools in that, in that area. Um, but the New England Farm to Institution uh, organization um, re just recently released some case studies and one of them was Boston Medical so a 498 bed facility they have three cafeterias and they serve close to a million meals out of the cafeteria annually plus all the patient food so this is very high volume stuff they serve fish about once a week 6,000 pounds a year and they've now switched to 100% uh, sustainable local seafood um, and then the Metro Toronto Convention Center is another example. So they feed about a million, a million people annually. And in 2011, they decided to actually make a pretty strategic shift for their marketing and, and trying to um, um, distinguish themselves in a market with a lot of convention centers and to go local. So they don't go 100% local, but they have a very strong seasonal local menu. They have very good relationships with producers, and they're really changing how they do some of their work. So that's just some ideas to give you like of what's kind of going on. You'll hear more here in a minute. And what I'm going to do is find that slide and do this one. So just to give you a little sense of who's in the room. So uh, as you know, if you registered, you filled out a little survey, gave us a little bit of information. So we had actually 65 people register, which is certainly indicative of the real interest and momentum in this topic, so we're really excited that there's that much interest. We have, as you can see, uh, sort of a qu quarter people coming from the publicly funded institutions, and then a range of private sector, NGO, um, food producers or distributors. And what I'd also like to say is the environments they work in are also really interesting. So we have people in the health sector, healthcare, we have people in schools, people uh, working in um, with maritime forces, meet people working in hotels, so there's a really good range of different food environments that are represented in the room and then you'll just have to bear with me because I have to now jump down to another slide um, one of the things that we also asked was what are some of the big questions or, or things that are emerging in the work that you're doing and so I just want to go through some of the things that you said about the challenges you're experiencing so one of them was how to shift thinking in action. So how do we shift thinking to put more value on local sustainable food from an institution's perspective? How do we move institutions from talking about these issues to actually making change? Um, questions of scale was a big one that came up. So what hurdles do you face when moving from traditional procurement from larger companies to smaller local services? What would it take to increase the capacity to meet the interest that's starting to emerge? How do we do some of that? And then what comes first? So some institutions say they can't buy local because there's not enough local food, but food producers can't grow more if they're having trouble selling what they have already. So you sort of feel a little stuck, like chicken and egg, what comes first? How do we kind of shift some of these things? 
So that's kind of what you guys said, and I think that's some of what uh, hopefully we'll all walk away with having a little bit more time to think through some of the questions, but also maybe some possible solutions or, or, or ways forward. That's it. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to introduce all three of the speakers now, and then they can just follow each other one after the other. So um, first, we're going to hear from Joshna, who um, has done some really exciting transformational work at Ryerson University and at some local hospitals in Toronto. Um, she's also been very involved in the STOP, um, and, and so she's going to share her work with us. And, and following that, we're going to hear from um, some people who have been involved in the work at Dalhousie University, uh, a, a homegrown story in our own backyard. That's where a lot of work has happened to transform bringing more local food into the, into the university procurement practices, as well as Sorry. As well as um, Now We're Cooking Daycare, which is a, a pilot project that's been happening in Colchester and East Can Hance County, um, where a grant was secured by three community health boards to support four local daycares um, to procure, um, to subsidize basically half of the cost of local food and to procure it in three different ways to sort of understand what works. Um, so we're going to be excited to hear from all three of those, but I'd love to welcome Joshna and then just when Joshna finishes, I'll invite Dal up and, um, but I'm not going to come up in between. So welcome Joshna. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. I am really, really happy to be here. I have spent the last couple of days um, with the lovely folks at Acadia, and I am so encouraged by all of the work that you are doing. You have a tremendous team of people here on the ground, uh, and just thinking back to when I started doing this work in 2011, uh, it was me and a couple other people who were like, Man, we're gonna try this out and see what we can do. Uh, to see now the sort of groundswell that really exists with so much enthusiasm and so many great ideas. Uh, so hopefully I can offer a bit of support and inspiration uh, for some of, with stories about some of the things that we have done in Southern Ontario to try and kickstart this movement, right? So just a little bit of background. I've spent the last three years, so I'm a chef, by training, I'm a chef, but community food security has really been my top priority. I've never been really that interested in restaurants and much more interested in how people are eating outside of restaurants, if you will. So as you heard, I spent four or five years running the kitchen at The Stop, which is a really wonderful community food center in Toronto. Um, and a uh, few years ago, I landed myself this amazing chance to tackle institutional food. Uh, I knew that it needed to be addressed, so I jumped in. I started out in two hospitals, uh, and then I've recently moved to education. So my last three years have been spent at Ryerson. The short end of a long story was that the pot had boiled over. Students were angry, justifiably, about campus food service. They were complaining about poor quality of food, uh, high prices, and really no transparency about how contracts are awarded. Uh, and it got bad enough that there was a bad news story on the cover of the Toronto Star, and the students were occupying the president's office, which was amazing. Uh, and so I was called in to help. Uh, and, to, and to see if we could spin a new idea for a new vision uh, for food service on campus. So I'll walk you through what we did. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because as much as I really believe that, um, that our spending is not the only way that we make change, I have to honestly tell you that that was by far the most impactful change that we were really able to make. So here's the story. First off, let's talk about the historical problem with institutional food services, right? We were talking about low quality, highly processed food. We have high prices with poor value for money. There's really just a priority on profits, not much else. The contracts are opaque and they favor corporate brands. And perhaps worst of all, there's really no connection to the campus community. Now, it should be said, Right? We have to sort of remember that the vast majority of campuses in Canada use third-party operators to deliver their food service. Uh, and there's a bit of a tension because we kind of, that culturally, right, we kind of sort of love to hate these guys. Uh, and they're not always in the best position uh, to, be able to, to be able to come to the table and give us exactly what we want. But I can tell you that I've had a couple of breakthroughs uh, and we've made some really great connections. Uh, and I do believe that it's important to figure out a way forward with an operator just because they are so omnipresent, right? And that we have to just figure out a way to work together. So, 
my idea, and this is what I pitched to Ryerson, was that what an institution needs to do is actually invest itself in its own sense of a vision for food. The trick, the problem I, I've addressed anyhow, is that we've left operators in charge of the leadership and the vision on these issues, uh, when really that is not their forte. Their forte is about deployment and about capacity. They can crank it out, right? And they can feed many, many, many people, but don't, don't ask them to do the guiding, right? The other piece that I think is really important, um, oh, maybe that's in another slide. So let's stay here. Uh, we're gonna talk about choosing to invest in a vision for food service, asking the operator to comply with your required framework, which really allows you to leverage the value of the contract. We kind of have to dangle that contract a little bit um, and create the vision that we want for change and then ask them to play along. So this is what we did. I helped Ryerson build a vision for food service. Uh, we really wanted to prioritize food and recognize its value to the university, right? Because the real problem with institutional food is not that we're not buying from the right place or using the right recipes. It's that food does not have any place of priority. Um, and it's not regarded as important. It's sort of an irritating necessity that is best just outsourced, you know? Uh, and the other thing that I think is really important is to allow the same visionary thinking that guides the institution's programs to guide the approach to food. The real disconnect that I found in all institutions, hospitals and universities, was that all of the pamphlets and the, the sort of propaganda material here at the front talks about excellence and boundless vistas of innovation and all these amazing huge ideas that somehow don't get applied to food service, right? And I never understood why. I never understood why those values were so different from each other. Um, and it, it didn't make any sense, and I've sort of wanted to hold up a mirror to the institution to say this, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, and these two things should be much more well aligned. So, Basically, my philosophy about food is that everybody should have access to food that is wholesome, affordable, and delicious. And I should note here that I have really intentionally moved away from talking about healthy because it's a really loaded term uh, and it, there's too many different meanings. And I specifically am talking wholesome because I want to open the door for farm fresh food. Right? We, want, we don't want to talk about processors. I want to talk about scratch cooking and we want to talk about food directly from local farms. I think I have a double slide here, just for impact. Uh, so this is the vision statement that I came up with. For Ryerson Eats was the name of our food service, our sort of freshened up food service. Ryerson Eats promotes fresh, wholesome, Ontario sourced food for our campus community. We believe that universities can nurture a more sustainable food system with thoughtful food procurement, consumption, and advocacy. And I was so excited to be in a place where I could write this and stick it on a wall and have it be the truth for my occurrence, for my situation, right? We actually had this on a wall uh, in the front of the cafe, uh, and it was amazing. I was like, my, my heart swelled when I saw the guys putting this thing up. To be able to proclaim that and to, on behalf of the university administration, tell the campus that this is now the direction in which we're moving, right? Very, very exciting. So how did we do it? First up, uh, so basically, right, what we're talking about, I helped Ryerson create an RFP, so, and I feel like most of you know what that is but we're talking request for proposals, right? You, you paint your dream in this document, cast it out to the public, and then see who applies. Uh, so these were the ideas that I thought were really important to go into the RFP. First up are really ambitious local sustainable procurement targets. Uh, this was 2013, I suggested a 25% per year with a 2% yearly increase. Uh, and also important in a, from a language perspective that we have local and sustainable procurement targets, right? There are a lot of factory feedlot farms in Ontario, so we're not just chasing postal codes here. I really care about how the food is grown. And while we don't necessarily have the capacity to jump in 100%, at least this language helps our feet be pointed in the right direction for growth, right? Next up are mandatory seasonal menus across the campus because this is how we're gonna maximize the use of our farm fresh food. Uh, the thing that I want to augment to this is that should be here actually is, is seasonal and diverse menus. Considering where Ryerson is in the heart of a very dense urban space in Toronto, it's very important to me that the menu that we serve is, is as reflective of the diversity of the people who are on that campus. 
Um, and as you can see, this is a plate of uh, chick uh, cauliflower potato curry. And it's, uh, it's a, it was important to me that food from all cultural backgrounds end up on, an, on a regular part of the menu and not just in some sort of weird ethnic food night kind of scenario, right? Because everybody can enjoy delicious good food from all over the world. You don't have to be Indian to get down with a nice curry. Uh, third up, of course, is student-friendly pricing. None of this works if the students can't afford it. And that, obviously, is the hugest challenge. Figuring out a way to make this work in a way that we can, we can legitimately um, lure students in, right? Bigger challenge that I had at Ryerson was that in a 10-minute walk radius of the campus, I had 300 food outlets competing for student dollars, which was no joke. Uh, so figuring out ways to lure students back on campus uh, was really my big challenge. Luckily, the only angle that I had over all those other folks was that I had wholesome, really wholesome food sourced with some integrity and some transparency. So we screamed as loud as possible about those things to keep students on campus. Next up is an increase in scratch cooking. So when I was working in hospitals, I realized that farm fresh food coming in the door meant more raw whole ingredients coming in the door, which meant that the team had to hustle it to start peeling beets and potatoes and chopping onions and all these things that they kind of never really did before. And so, uh, so I brought in a team of chefs who I knew were really dedicated and committed to doing this kind of work and to sort of the trial and error of wrangling the staff and you know pulling the reins back and sending everybody in another direction. The other important piece here is about the human connection. Right? It was really important for me that every, all the students on the campus knew that there was a human being on campus somewhere in a kitchen cooking food for them every day, thinking about them. Imagine that, right? Um, and we had a lot of fun because fresh chefs had freedom to cook whatever, you know, whatever they wanted, whatever was in season, whatever the fridge said we needed to use up. Um, but we were able to make beautiful meals like this. And that really changed the tone because it was an indicator of a level of care and attention that really we haven't seen in a lot of institutional food. The second piece was an effective waste mitigation plan. There's two angles on this. First, we're talking about just really thoughtful use of, of leftovers and scraps, but it's also about and, or, and how the, the, the sort of the closed loop on the cycle of our production really is being managed. Uh, this is about working with physical plant to think about composting and organic separation and that sort of thing, because it's really, it's not as prevalent as perhaps it should be. The other side of this piece is about sharing surplus food. Uh, and figuring out methods for extras to go to folks who need them. Uh, and we came up with a lot of really great solutions. Uh, I would, like, there were times where I literally would drive a cart of extra soup through the dining hall after hours where students were still studying and just give them a little something to keep going. Other times we would pack things up and send them over to what was called the Good Food Room, which was essentially a campus food bank run by the student union. And then, we, considering where we were in the city, we had a whole bunch of social service agencies around us who could easily have you, you know, they, they loved getting extra, you know what I mean, trays of surplus food. It was really important that this food not just go in the garbage, right? We have to figure out a way to share this around. And really, it's just about, the reason this is in there is because we wanted operators to come to the table with a plan, uh, like packaging, labeling, communications plan, because food safety obviously needs to be maintained throughout this whole process. And we just wanted them to have a thoughtful idea about how to pull this off. And finally, we wanted a commitment to participate in and nurture the food culture on campus and the institution's commitment to sustainability, right? We wanted them to play our game, right? And to understand that they, that they are sort of representatives of the institution and need to be guided by the institution. This is a photo of our first community meal. One of the things that, was, that I installed was a seasonal meal where we all got together and we put tables down. Um, to just enjoy a meal. It was always a seasonal meal. It was a pay what you can meal because I, we, we wanted zero barriers to any of this. Um, and it was lovely. It was amazing to see. At its, at its peak, we had about 286 people join us uh, for a meal, which was amazing considering how busy uh, our campus really is. So this is the dream that we painted. Let's, I'm gonna tell you now a bit about what actually happened. And we got pretty close, we got pretty close. 
So let's talk, well, we're going to talk procurement because it's perhaps the stickiest and most uh, oh, sometimes frustrating in it. First up, we need to talk about building relationships. So in Southern Ontario, I'm very lucky. We have this amazing supplier called 100 Kilometer Foods, who's a local distributor, and they provide access to products from 60 plus family farms in Southern Ontario. The reason that they are so great is because they do the work for us. I trust them completely to make good decisions about making connections with farmers. And no institutional purchaser is going to spend the time to cultivate all those individual relationships, right? The other side of it is it's not that easy to get a farmer on the phone, <laughs> right? Uh, so having Paul and Grace, who are the husband-wife team at the helm, they did all that talking for me. They did all those connections, but I was able to have really, uh, really quick momentary connections to really great food, uh, which was a huge gift. So they had a weekly price list and we would purchase from there. Um, and it was perfect, right? It was perfect. We had, I remember when I was in the hospitals, we wanted to put apples on the menu and at the first apples that showed up were huge and the dietitians were freaking out because the portion size was too big. And so I went back to Paul and Grace and I said, well, how can we get smaller apples? And they called Tori Warner, who was the farmer who grew the apples, who said, hey, man, I have twos and threes kicking around that would order automatically just get mulched under or go to sauce or some other random thing. I would so happily sell them to you for like hardly any money at all, right? So then next day shows up a crate of beautiful, tiny, like four bite apples, some of which even still had leaves on them. Which in the, in the, like, it was such a glaring, strange thing to see in the stainless steel hospital kitchen, right? It was amazing to see this proper, perfect little apple on the tray. But the, the freedom to, to have that negotiation was as a result of this small relationship, right? So these are two beautiful folks. These are farmers. And the, on that local food slide with the rows and rows of greens, that's their farm. And they grow these amazing salad greens. They're huge advocates uh, of what we're trying to do. They're tremendous allies. I take my team out to visit them so that they can really have some connection to where the food has come from. Um, and the thing that was amazing when I was working in hospitals was I never imagined the farmer to patient relationship, right? I never, I didn't really think about the fact that farmers would be so thrilled uh, at the idea that their food was actually being served to hospital patients. And so, of course, this is rolled over because the idea of being of university students eating this food as well has thrilled everybody. Uh, and these folks also, they have a greenhouse that grows amazing Japanese cucumbers, uh, but so many of them are too curly for market, sadly. Um, and they were selling them at a reduced rate. And the, it was the best feeling for me to send this email out to all of my chefs saying from this moment on, we are gonna buy as many of these ugly curly cucumbers as possible and you need to make pickles and relish and soup and I don't care what else. Uh, and I want a big bowl of these things in the cafe with a conversation about our embrace of this off-size ugly produce, right? And they sold us to it for a dollar a piece, right? It's a win-win it's a situation. I don't care about the shape. We're gonna chop it all up anyway, right? Uh, so it's a perfect, perfect connection to think about ugly fruit, ugly vegetables, and twos and threes having a really great outlet through institutions. All right. Uh, the other amazing thing that came out of this was uh, they grow potatoes on this farm. Uh, this, is, this is my Ryerson Eats team, but when we took our hospital team out there, they showed us the rows and rows of potatoes, but they had lost two or three rows to potato bugs that year because they didn't have enough money for nets for all of their rows. So the director of nutrition services comes up to me and she's like, wait a minute, my budget sits in the bank for waiting for me to spend it. Can't I just give these nice people some money in the beginning of the year so that they can buy all of the nets and then just bring me potatoes? At which point I like clutch her and start weeping saying, yes, you have just, dis you have just uh, mentioned the first institutional CSA, my friend, and of course we can do that, right? Uh, but this little bit of creativity, I am convinced that hosp a hospital food budget can keep a farm going for a season, right? And we can just start pairing them up like that. And what an amazing idea that we have regularly just have a farmer delivering because we've made an investment in them, right? That's really what we're talking about here. 
Next up is, is following from that, this is a good segue, leveraging institutional purchasing power. So this is my favorite bit. This is the most exciting. At Ryerson, we had a really big catering business, right? As I'm sure every university campus does. And it was all about trays of sandwiches, cookies, and fruit. But these cookies are these giant, really synthetic things that get underbaked to suggest that they're chewy um, <laughs> and they're gross. And when you engage with them, people generally just break them in half, but they leave the other half on the plate. And nobody's going to pick that other half up, so that's a wasted half of a cookie. And I saw this happening, so I called the supplier, and I said, can you please just make me a smaller cookie because this is not working? And they were like, well, the machine is only set up to do one thing. I can't really make much change. Uh, so uh, no, essentially. And so I thought this was ridiculous, and I called a friend of mine who's a baker, and I said, listen, I need some cookies. Uh, I have 66 cents. That's how much we were spending on the other ones. What can you do for me? And she, in a bit of disbelief, uh, came over and brought me four samples of beautiful, delicious cookies that are two and a half inches, right, which is exactly what I wanted. Um, but the amazing thing is that we, and she was like, 66 cents? Giddy up, let's go, right? It was amazing. <laughs> the best thing is my first order was for 500 cookies. Subsequently, we ordered 1,000 cookies a week. Right? And for convocation, when we had all the students and their parents there for these pretty, pretty receptions, we ordered 16,000 cookies from her. Right? And it was amazing to see her texting us photos of her and like her brother and her son's girlfriend and everybody scooping cookie dough in the bakery, right? Which was wonderful. Like, what a joyful thing to, to know that there's a kitchen on campus or in the city somewhere that's busily preparing, right? And the photos of the stacks and stacks of boxes as they left her bakery into the truck on the way over to us. Uh, it was joyful, right? It's such a nice connection. Plus, right, so here's the cookies. This is Andrea. And look at these delicious cookies, right? This is the other piece. There was never a cookie left on the counter. If they weren't eaten, they were shoved into pockets for later on, right? Which I'm totally okay with. Uh, the thing that's important here also is that she was using local grains and horizontally traded chocolate. So those orders saw the boost as well, right? There's this really beautiful domino effect that starts happening uh, when, that, when these orders come through. And I was so much happier to give her a tens of thousands of dollars bo a boost in her sales than just sending it over to some big corporation that didn't really care about what I was doing in the first place, right? Uh, and this, this was amazing, keeping her going. Like we were talking about fifty to sixty thousand dollars worth of cookies a year, um, and it's win-win. There's no sacrifice here. We haven't had to give anything up to pull this off, you know. Um, so the local paper got uh, got wind of this, um, and I loved the idea that this quote here: by ordering from small Toronto area businesses and suppliers to fill the bellies of its students and staff, Ryerson University is supporting the local economy and serving better cookies, right? She would also send us little treats along with the orders with little messages and thank yous, which was, you know what I mean? Cisco never did that. <laughs> so next up, following from there, is talking about getting quality food on campus. We, Monforte Dairy is a brilliant cheese making operation in Stratford, Ontario. Ruth Claussen is at the helm. She is a brilliant woman, perhaps most famous for building the first cheese CSA, right? She lost her. She was in a lot of danger of losing her operation. So she garnered support from her community, raised a huge chunk of money, uh, and is doing beautiful, beautiful things. And we are buying tons of her cheese uh, for our catering menu. It was easier for catering because we could roll that cost out. It wasn't as easy for student food because I couldn't keep the costs low because that's not cheap cheese. Uh, but our, cater our, our Artisanal Ontario cheese board was pretty much a Monforte cheese board. And I was thrilled to do it, right? Ruth is a dear friend. Um, and I loved the idea that I had the, ch the opportunity to support her this way. So next up, uh, plus you see her at the market and she like runs out from behind the table to give me a really big hug. Again, Cisco never did that. Uh, so here, this is a plate, this is from our first community meal, but this is a real indicator of what meals at Ryerson started to look like. These are the greens from the folks uh, at the new farm. Their dressing is uh, strawberries from Warner's in Beamsville, 
And we had this amazing quarter acre farm on the roof of the engineering building that produced all the vegetables that went into the pasta dish. Uh, and making those connections, anytime we had rooftop food in the meals, I told the staff we need to scream about it because the excitement of the fact that we are field to table on campus is amazing. The fourth principle is our focus on scratch cooking. This was easily, this was the first move that I made because I really wanted to open up the freedom uh, for my cooks to play and experiment and also to really maximize the use of whole ingredients. So Jason Persall is a wonderful farmer and he grows, he, they produce cold pressed non-GMO virgin oils. They have sunflower, soy, and canola and they are delicious and have all if not more of the health benefits of really good olive oil. Uh, what I loved about it is that they also had a fryer oil. Uh, and we have deep fryers that we use on campus. Uh, and it's great. Uh, but it was just pennies difference in the cost between this oil and the oil that uh, Cisco was offering us. And so again, it was an amazing moment to be able to just send an email out to all of the chefs saying from this moment forward, we're gonna start using this different oil. Really easy switch, but now, but, and, but much better to enable us to support a local supplier. Also, because we were cooking from scratch, all of our sauteing was being done with these beautiful oils as well. Uh, and it was amazing, it was great that we were able to build beautiful meals uh, using great stuff to start with. And these are two happy cooks. Uh, I, I roped in a bunch of pals of mine uh, from the industry to have some fun and to try this out to see if we could really make this work. Um, and it was, it was just as joyful for them as it is for us, right? They understood the challenge that was in front of them and they played along uh, and we did amazingly beautiful things together. The big finish here is flexibility. So Brian Gilvesi is a farmer who naturally raises Texas Longhorn cattle in Tilsonburg. He is an amazing steward of the land. He's a lovely guy, and the, these creatures are so beautiful. Uh, we took our team for a tour of that farm as well to really understand what's involved in raising animals well, talking about grass-fed beef especially. Now, we all know that grass-fed beef is more expensive, and it should be. There's lots of great reasons, and but, so I didn't really think about it too much because I knew that we couldn't afford it yet, and and to me, the answer is not just to ask the farmer for a discount, right? That's not, that's not the way forward here. So what beautiful thing showed up was that Brian sells to restaurants, and he does sort of a monthly run on his inventory, and one day, he called us, saying, listen, at the end of this month, I have beef cheeks and strip loins left that I haven't moved. David, who was our catering chef, who is a wonderful cook, had, uh, and, we, and we have freezer space, right? Institutions have freezer space. Uh, and so he, was, he took them, and he was able to be flexible and add them into a menu somehow, and then Brian gave us a solid deal on them. What I like about that is that we earned that discount, right? It wasn't just a sort of charitable offering. We did him a favor every month by clearing out his inventory, uh, which worked for him, right? We did him a favor, he did us a favor, and that was a really, really great relationship that allowed us to serve this glorious beef carpaccio uh, for an on, on, on dock dinner, right? And would you ever have suggested that this is what institutional food could look like, right? It was amazing. Um, and for us to be able to tell the story was even more exciting. I believe that is the end of it all here. But list, let me tell you, let me end with this, and then I think at some point we'll go to questions. Uh, the most profound thing that I discovered by working at Ryerson and going through this project was that the institution actually can be a tool for change. Right? We think about them as these behemoths that are stayed and not moving, but we really can use them in ways that nurture local economies, support agriculture, and really build and connect to their communities. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, and I was thrilled that we were able to pull it off with such great success. So it's possible, folks. We can do this. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that, uh, thank you for that lovely presentation. That was inspiring. And hopefully we'll uh, model some of those uh, examples and what we're going to present here. I'm Rochelle. I'm the Director of Sustainability at Dalhousie University. And uh, we've worked with different groups on campus, including food services, on creating a healthy and sustainable framework. 
and a lot of different actions. Our office tracks uh, things like local procurement, and we participate in international rating systems, so it's all transparent uh, on, on the web, how we're doing. And uh, we're just launching a new framework, and uh, I might add, the Department of Health helped us with a student with that, the Thrive Grant. So if Carla's here, my report is coming this week <laughs> with, the, with the framework piece, which is uh, we're going to talk about some of the highlights there. And uh, Angela, who's with uh, Food Services, and there's some other people here from Dell, Deborah with the college, and Adam with Chartwells, and, and anybody else here from Dell? No, oh, great. Okay, I think I got everyone. So uh, Angela's going to start. We have it time, so hopefully that will work out all right. Yeah, it's giving me a bit of anxiety, the timing. Okay. Part, no. <laughs> all right. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. So it is in a timer, so I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Angela Emerson, and I work for Dalhousie Food Services. I'm a dietitian, but my role is to promote healthy and sustainable food across campus. So I'm going to start it. Here we go. So we're going to take you through the framework in the next few minutes. So we'll be around after for questions as well. Um, so when the presentation rolls, you'll see the different goals that have been set um, through operational goals. And the first ones is our purchasing goals. So we do have a farm to table program that we started about seven years ago. It does track all of our purchasing and we really do track our purchasing and we go visit our farmers. We have seasonal menus. We do cook from scratch as well. We order all of our produce in bulk, cut it in house. Uh, rinse it and host and all of that. These are some of our local suppliers. It's not a complete list. It's just to give you an idea. We're always looking to move forward on this list. Trust me, it's not complete and it's not staying still. <laughs> uh, last year, we launched our sustainable seafood program, which is diverse. Um, we partnered with the Ecology Action Center and Off the Hook, and we're hoping to get more local sustainable seafood into the dining halls. Our four dining halls also became MSC certified, which supports uh, wild sustainable fish. So this is just uh, at this event we promoted it, both of those things. We also partner with local bakeries and we promote a lot of in-house baking on campus using our own employees. So this is a lovely picture of one of our bakers baking off some muffins. Um, so increasing sustainably sourced on top of the local um, as well. So we focus on this. Um, I already talked about off the hook, so we'll talk about uh, fair trade. So we do support fair trade coffee and tea in all of our dining halls, catering, and as much as possible in retail, of course. We also offer fair trade chocolate bars. <laughs> Reducing packaging, so this is pretty easy in the dining halls because you can use reusable um, service ware and purchase in bulk and all of that. And we also use paper plates. We don't use styrofoam, of course, and anything like that in retail. Um, I already mentioned that we purchase in bulk for our produce. We also use bulk condiments in our dining halls, which is very easy to do in the dining hall. We promote bringing your own mug to our retail locations and offer a discount. And we give away several mugs throughout the year, too. We have a huge amount of reusable mugs for some reason. We just give them away to everybody. <laughs> The other part of the framework, which is really exciting, is to maximize the nutritional benefits. So cooking from scratch and offering a low-sodium, gluten-free stock increases the nutritional benefits right there by decreasing the sodium. Uh, we also work continuously on decreasing sodium, sugar, and different saturated fats. Uh, we have tons of students that have dietary concerns, so I work one-on-one -on -one with them to make combinations, uh, depending if they are no gluten, vegan, uh, things like that, halal as well. So we're very transparent. Um, these six m menu icons are at the station, so you can see right away what you're getting. And some students look for more specific information, the nutritional table. I'm going to pass it over to Rochelle. Okay. Uh, in our scope, we look at procurement, but also operations. We've crawled around the kitchens and audited 350 pieces of equipment, and we probably $600,000 in the last four years have been ch changing out old equipment to Energy Star equipment, variable speed drives on hoods. Kitchens are about five times the energy of, of normal spaces, so we've got it down to about three times. LED lighting in the chandeliers, yes, you can do that, so uh, we have that. So it's just lighting, variable speed drives, water. Uh, we've gone trailers, that was a while back, when I first started at the University 2008 initiative of the different food services saved a lot of uh, organic waste and water. And certainly in the kitchens, all the, all the different dining halls on campus and kitchens, they weigh their waste in the kitchen to make sure it's efficient in terms of production at the front end. And we have composting at the back end. A little shout out to the students. Different student societies on Dell are doing different things. So they have the Load at Ladle that does free meals and they get their um, stuff from local farms. And also here is 900 pounds of produce that came from our agricultural campus. There's an on-farm uh, 
and this is uh, to the Halifax. So there's the Chef Gardens, it's one acre. Uh, produce goes into the uh, dining hall there, and this is the first year 900 pounds were brought to Halifax. So it was pretty successful teaching. Again, up at the agricultural campus, but across the university, there is curriculum around food and research. This is research in the fields there at the Chef's Garden, but there's also a community garden. Here's uh, in food services, uh, teaching cooking classes, the chef, and students learning about healthy eating and cooking. So that's uh, some programs that we want to continue. This is the Common Roots Farm and students having their own plots and bringing that food back into the Loaded Ladle. And the Student Sustainability Society also have a farm market. Here's our framework. We're going to publish it. <laughs> 20 pages, took us a year. 1,500 comments from students, staff, and faculty, two focus groups, literature review, thematic analysis. These are some of the big themes. Very interesting uh, for us to get some more feedback on some of the other features. And I would add um, that they were, we're finished. <laughs> 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 we tried to time it to the five minutes, Justin. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Jill Conrad, um, and I'm a dietetic intern at Colchester East Hands Health, Health Center. Um, we're located in Churro. So I'm here to talk to you about um, a project we've been working on. It's called Now We're Cooking Local Child Care Project. Um, so this happened in the Colchester and East Hands region. So to give you a little bit of background, um, this manual for food and nutrition in regulated child care settings um, was revised and came out again in June 2013. Um, so, and this was um, mandated for child care centers to be licensed. So that was really important for, um, for the child care centers to kind of stick to those standards. So in, in, uh, we wanted, after the standards came out, um, we kind of felt that this was an opportunity to work with this sector. Um, so instead of kind of enforcing the standards, we kind of wanted to um, focus, um, sorry, <laughs> um, we wanted to um, focus on more so the spirit of the policy. So that's just focusing on real food and scratch cooking and supporting that. And we found that a lot of the uh, centers were kind of focused on finding products that fit specific nutrition criteria. So we kind of wanted to take that away and more just focus on real food and local food. So in April 2015, uh, we had a workshop with 35 child care centers. Uh, so a local producer came who also sourced the event. Um, and they also have training in early childhood education. So they came to the workshop um, to talk about the importance of local food and kind of taught us how to make some uh, recipes using local food and in season. So at this workshop, we pitched an idea of a pilot project for three centers um, to team up with a um, community shared agriculture or a farmer's market. Um, so they, they teamed up and uh, they, the market would provide them with a local food box um, that kind of sustained them from May to October of that summer. So we actually had four centers um, who showed interest in this project. So two centers split the community shared agriculture box and one was supported through Churros Farmers Market and the other was supported through Withrow's Farmers Market in Elmsdale. Um, so we actually got a community health grant board. Um, so we got to split the cost with these child care centers. So they were only required to pay half. So each box, we paid $200 for the whole season for each center. Um, so they would pay the same as well. So it really helped them out. Um, and it really took the pressure off of these centers to focus on the nutrition criteria and they could just focus on serving this healthy local food. So in terms of challenges, financial was one for sure at the beginning, but we were fortunate to get that community health grant board, um, community health board grant. And um, so the time was, was an issue for some of the centers to use all of that fresh produce within that given week. Um, it, some of the boxes lacked variety. Um, some of this, the CSA boxes, uh, they tended to get a lot of leafy greens, but that was due to uh, crop damage. So, um, and the last challenge we had was um, 
In terms of capacity, we didn't necessarily reach all of the child care centers that maybe needed it the most. Um, so the four centers that did show interest, they kind of were already on board for the standards and they were already um, very interested in supporting local. So we didn't necessarily get to reach those other centers that maybe could have benefited from it. But, in, but the centers that we did work with, um, the project was very beneficial. And with a mixed approach of the market and the, and the CSA boxes, there were pros and cons to each. Um, so pros, um, they got to establish a relationship with the vendor. And cons, um, they did stay in their comfort zone because they did get to choose their own foods. And in terms of the CSA, um, a pro is that they were challenged um, to incorporate these new foods into their menu. And a con was that they were impacted by crop damage. So some benefits, um, it really increased the, child, the children's involvement and exploration with food. They really got to um, work with the food and learn about it, learn where it comes from. Um, and there were more conversations around that too between the children and those conversations also went home and they were had with the parents as well. And this project was really done with them and not to them. So they kind of got that involvement as well. So this is Daniel. He was known to be a picky eater in his daycare. Um, so one day he was helping to prepare a salad and he picked up this radish. And out of nowhere, he just took a bite out of the raw radish. And everyone was really surprised to see that. But it really showed that when he was involved with the whole project and um, like seeing it from the very beginning to how it was prepared, helping to prepare it. And then he really just got really interested in this radish. And so he tried it. <laughs> and he chose to do this all himself, which was really important. So overall, we're very optimistic that this will continue within the centers that we worked with. Um, it took the focus off the standards, but it actually really emphasized them more, um, just focusing around those healthy local foods. Uh, the cost wasn't as much of an issue. Um, as we said, I, we helped out with that. Um, the children tried new foods where it comes from, and they got to help pr to prepare it as well. Um, the parents learned new recipes, and they even got some of the leftovers that the children helped to produce. Um, and the staff also learned new ways to prepare um, the importance of local food, and they also got to try new foods as well. So in the future, we're planning on getting all the recipes from um, the different centers that they use and making a cookbook with them to distribute to the local centers. Um, and we really learned through this project that these centers work with families that are most vulnerable. So it's really, we kind of felt like this was almost a pathway to reach those families. So if we can work with these centers in the future to kind of reach those vulnerable populations, that would be really important in terms of health equity and food security. And just to leave you with this, um, one of the daycare centers reported that um, they had to invest in buying more forks through this project because through all of the local produce, they were serving more salads. Um, so we just found that that was a really interesting point. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we wanted to mainly take time for questions for Joshna, um, but then hopefully the DAL project and the, and the project that we just heard from will be kind of circulating around over lunch for other questions. So um, maybe if you just want to take a minute and think to yourself, what's the big question that you'd love to ask Joshna? And I'll invite Joshna up to take questions for about 10, 15 minutes. So Joshna, my question is about scaling this up. So you yeah. have uh, just Rob Strang from Public Health in the Department of Health and Wellness. Uh, so you start, you have experience uh, at a community level and then a hospital and now shifting that to, uh, uh, to a university. Yep. So, my, so two part question, so the, the progress you made in the hospital, was that sustained after you left? Uh, not, a, not the degree that I'd like. Uh, and that is only because my presence there was uh, the, like grant funding for yeah. nine months. Right is only going to be have so much impact. The way I explain it to people is that it took us about twenty five years to get into the mess, so it's going to take us longer yeah. than nine months to get out. So that's that, that means that's, an indication of the need for ongoing yes frontline leadership. A hundred percent. What are your thoughts? Because my head's spinning around. Yeah, How do we amazing. Scale this up and bring together 
Is there any conversation in Toronto, so it's not just Ryerson, but bringing together multiple universities with hospitals, all these institutional kitchens, to have an ongoing conversation with both the Chartwells and the Cisco's of the world, yeah, but also yeah, yeah. with the agriculture producers. I, it, it's the scale and the and by coming together and the potential scope and scale of, mm -hmm. of the purchasing that's required. And I, so I don't know where to, I got to process it a lot, but I just totally. want to get any thoughts on there how are. you scale this up and create these networks between institutions right. in the agriculture sector and the and and the and the wholesalers and the manufacturers yep. and stuff. To, there, to, you're you're very well. wise to point in this direction. And so one of the things I made a we in Ontario we got a piece of legislation called the Local Food Act, and what came with that was a local food fund. Um, unfortunately, it did not have the effect that it was supposed to have, but my application was about a program that sort of you maybe scaled down the scope in order to scale up the idea, right? So in, in Ontario, we grow onions, carrots, and potatoes, and apples beautifully, and I feel like your story here is not much different, right? And every kitchen needs those things. So I had this idea that we could pilot a, a scaling initiative with about five to 10 other universities, and if we could, Go to my, you know, I go to my suppliers, and they could go to the farmers to lock in the su the supply, uh, and and the delight of that is that it meant the grow the uh, the emergence of farmer co-ops and things like that, right? So the pooling carrots, potatoes, onions, and apples together, we could potentially lock in pricing for a year. These institutions could commit to purchasing all of their carrots, onions, potatoes, apples this way, and then. Uh, and then off we go. And then they have a sense of what this is all about because people really, the message that I hear from people all the time is that they need me to hold their hands through this process, right? It is difficult. There's lots of bumps around the way. But if we could support one initiative to trial it out in a number of universities across southern Ontario, then we'll at least have some data and we'll have some history and some precedent of how this works, what needs to change in order for us to keep moving to the next level. Because the difficulty about it all is that not all kitchens are cooking from scratch, so they don't necessarily have the use of whole ingredients. Uh, and there's so many of these sort of weird um, uh, variables that need to be controlled in this experiment. Uh, one of the other opportunities that we did was uh, we partnered with uh, a, a it's called the Hospitality Workers Training Center, and they intentionally work to upskill hospitality workers. Um, and so where with the way I organized it was that they our hundred kilometer foods would deliver the raw ingredients to the training center. They would cut the the folks would process the vegetables to the specs of my team in the kitchen for whatever our menu needed, and then our supplier would pick that up and deliver it over to us at Ryerson. Uh, so it was still beautiful local produce, and we had free labor in the sense because it was a training initiative for these folks who needed some upskilling because one of the big challenges is getting institutional cooking kitchens cooking again, right? A lot of these folks have been cutting open vac sealed bags for the last 20 something years. And so bringing sort of pull, uh, you know, pulling that back up in another direction, it was a huge effort. So if we could incorporate this training piece in, uh, it worked brilliantly. And we I just see these gorgeous vac sealed bags of processed Ontario vegetables uh, ready for my team to start cooking with. So there are a lot of creative ideas uh, in which uh, th that we can do this. We just, I think we just need a little bit. Uh, we need we need government to play. We need government to jump in here. And the biggest issue here, this if we if I had a dream from government from how they could support this, it would be investing in the experiment, right? Because nobody has the nobody has the funds and the resources to to pay me to be there for two years to watch something grow. You know what I mean? Uh, and because it's so young and so so fragile, I need to watch it every moment. Right, I need to be there, close, constantly, my sh my hands on people's shoulders, you know, nudging them in a different direction. Uh, so we really do need resources to try this out. Um, but there are a lot of very promising, creative opportunities. Yeah. 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 On the flip side, do you have any experience or thoughts on how do we have lots of institutional kitchens, and then we have daycares and schools and stuff that don't have necessarily the kitchen capacity? Do you have any thoughts or, or any experience in how perhaps partnering with big institutional kitchens along these lines to then be providers to 
the daycares and schools. Yeah, there's no reason why that couldn't work, right? These kitchens are ready. Uh, most of them kind of shut down by about 2.30 in the afternoon once lunch service is done. So there's no reason why we couldn't have those kinds of partnerships, even if it's just something as simple as making soups, Right, we start out with soups and soup production that can then get tra that can get sent around. Um, there's a lot of beautiful, beautiful opportunities for this kind of collaboration. Um, so, one of the, I didn't see anybody from the Justice Department here. I don't know if anybody is anybody, but there's a really interesting documentary on the radio, maybe the last two days, um, saying that when they started feeding um, people in correctional facilities better, they reduced the kind of out, you know, crankiness. Yeah. <laughs> By about 30 to 50%. Yes. And I'm just wondering, is any, and this was from New York State, but okay. in your experience, is anybody trying this in Canada in terms of correctional facilities and lo longer term social impact outcomes? And I think like yeah. one of the one of the value propositions for government is like, it'll cost us less yes. in the out at the end if we invest now. Yep. So I'm just wondering yep. if you, any anything about correctional facilities. So it's like it's the next piece that I would love to dive into, right? I would love to start talking about prison uh, prisons and how we're feeding those folks. Uh, I've heard some terrible news in Ontario about the fact that we actually spend more to feed a prisoner than we do to feed a patient in Ontario, which is a bit of a... <laughs> Right? That's a really loaded discussion. But to your point, there's even, I mean, there's, there's a hospital equivalent as well where you are suggesting like $1,200 a day is what it costs for a hospital bed in Ontario, right? And, and, but when they only give us $7.33 a day for three meals of food ingredients. And I said, give me 10 bucks, you know what I mean? Bump it up, give me two, I need another $2.66 per patient per day and I will give you exponentially better food. Um, and so there, unfortunately, because we're so young in this initiative, there is little to no academic research to really underpin all of this. Um, and so I have a few academic pals who are really focusing around institutional food, uh, and we're trying to sort of populate the feed as it would be. Uh, but I think I think there is there we I think that's the next direction we need to go. I personally would love to, to jump in there and see what's happening. But I also think that we need to have more thoughts about the correlation between uh, good, healthy food served in a, in a really caring, respectful manner uh, and the, the short and long-term impacts that has on people's mental health. And particularly in corrections, we want to talk about rehabilitation and readiness to move back out into the world. Uh, there's, I, I'm excited about what that possibility could hold. We got time for one more, they tell me. My name is Kimberly Hernandez. Hi. Rob. <laughs> I'm with public health and government as well. And my question is really around these wonderful positive things you talked about. But mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the challenges and how you overcame those oh boy. challenges. Yes. Uh, okay, there were a lot of challenges. Uh, the lot, perhaps the hardest was my team and, and rallying the staff, uh, right? We're talking unionized staff who have been there for man, 35 years, right? To be quite honest with you, the vast majority of them had looked at me and they, they, they were convinced, they were like, we're gonna at last you, honey. You know what I mean? They, <laughs> they a lot of them, they, were, they, were, they thought that they could sort of grit their teeth and dig their heels in and that soon I would just pack my knives and leave. Uh, for sure, for sure, for sure. And so I had to work really hard to convince them that this change was real and legitimate, uh, right? And I so, and it was it was hugely difficult, right? One of the one of the worst examples was in at Scarborough Hospital. We there was lots of excitement about the project, and we had this center spread in the Globe and Mail, me with a hairnet on in the center of the paper. But anyway, uh, there's no way that the newspaper would have written a story about the intrepid hospital cooks who have, who have weathered the storm of budget cuts for the last 25 years. But my team, like they haven't read any Michael Pollan books, and you know what I mean? They haven't watched Food Inc. They don't know, uh, they're not connected to the politics of this issue on the outside. And so they were hurt, right? They were really hurt that they're, because the truth is, they've been making it work. 
right? They keep getting handed crappy budget cuts and worse conditions to work in, and they keep making it work. Uh, and so they were so hurt that that was not mentioned, you know, that, that they were trying their best was not mentioned. Um, but they really weren't connected to the fact that it never really would be in that context because of the noise of the idea that we were making this change. So I had to work really hard to win them over. They like literally didn't speak to me for a couple of weeks, right? They were mad. Uh, and I got it and I understood it. So we tried to figure out a way to over. So what I did for those two things worked really well. One was taking the team out to a farm. I can't tell you enough how effective taking that team out to a farm really was. It connected to parts of them. A lot of these folks are from immigrant populations who have really strong agriculture, you know what I mean? Home, kitchen, garden kind of vibes happening. And it lights started going off. I saw these good food light bulbs start going off of above everybody's head. They understood it, right? And they, and they were excited that that's what we were trying to do. And that's the connection that we were trying to make. The other thing that I did in a bit of desperation, to be quite honest, was I reached out to my food community right, full of advocates, chefs, gardeners, policy folks, academics, and I said, the subject line of the email was, our hospital project needs a cheering section. And I asked them to please send me a message to this team. And I created a board in the kitchen, and I put all of the messages up there, right, because I wanted my team to understand what a big deal this was, right? And although it's so hard and so messy, if we, the fact that we are tackling this is giant, and now maybe it's, it's more comforting on the days when they are hating everything, to be able to walk past this wall and see that there's a whole community of people who are rooting them on, on the outside. And they worked, both of those worked really, really well. Not easy though, man, whoa, that wasn't easy. <laughs> Not easy. Um, okay, I think that is all, but I will be here, and I'll be so happy to chat with you later on. Thank you so much, Joshna. Um, and uh, Patty's going to say some final thank yous. But I just wanted to say that this really, this event wants to be the launch of a network in Nova Scotia that's really thinking together about how we scale this up and accelerate institutional procurement work locally. So for those of you that aren't staying for the workshop this afternoon, we'll be in touch about future opportunities to be involved. And we hope that you will stay involved. Um, there will be an evaluation coming in a week or so. and. Food Arc is very committed to learning about how to mobilize action around food security issues, so please take the time to fill out the evaluation. It really matters to us. Um, and for those of you that are staying this afternoon, um, we want it, there's gonna be some intentional time to get both peer support and intentional coaching and, um, and, and support from Joshna around the projects that are, that are really actively working to make change around institutional procurement right now. So when you go outside in the lobby where lunch is being served, for those of you staying for lunch, you'll see a little board. Um, if you are working on a project right now that's making change around institutional procurement, and you're willing to be part of this workshopping to get some support to tell your story, please write down the title of it on a post-it note there and post it in one of the sessions. There's only eight sessions, so first come, first serve. Um, and we will be starting back here uh, at 12.15. Um, and, and I don't know, is there something to say about the lunch or it's straightforward? Straightforward, okay. So I'm just gonna hand it over to Patty for some final thank yous. So I, I first, I, I want to thank um, Josh now on behalf of us all, I'm sure, um, for um, just generously sharing your time here in Nova Scotia and your story, the amazing story. And you've left us, you've definitely delivered on the inspiration, I would say, we all agree, and also on really concrete um, ideas for that you can leave us with. So I'm really, yeah excited to dig in more this afternoon for those of you who can stay. So um, I also want to um, acknowledge again the funding support that we had to be able to put this on um, today from um, Select Nova Scotia and also the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation. And um, we 
had a really amazing organizing committee um, in terms of the Ecology Action Center, um, Satcha at the lead of the helm there, and, um, and also the team at Food Arc with um, Alia and Megan and the rest of the team there. We also had um, folks from the Department of um, Agriculture and um, who were involved in helping to shape this, and then also um, a lot of involvement from the Department of Health and Wellness and uh, with Anne-Marie. Um, and maybe I can get everybody who's on the organizing committee just to stand up and um, take um, some acknowledgement for helping to organize. And. Um, And um, is Claire? No, Becky. Sorry, I missed too many meetings. <laughs> so I'm, um, and I'm sure we probably missed somebody else. Did I miss anybody else from the organizing committee? And Justin, yes, and Justin from the EAC. And um, I also want to just acknowledge that um, I actually ran into Mr. Minister Glavine, uh, the Minister of Health and Wellness, last night at a Nova Scotia Health Research event, and he was um, um, asking me about today and what was happening. And so really glad to have Dr. Um, Strang here with us today on behalf of the minister as well from the department. So thanks, everybody, for coming, and look forward to um, talking further with uh, many of you this afternoon. Enjoy lunch. <laughs>